Greetings, friends. I thought we would talk a little bit about um, the next stages with the Declaration of Independence. Um, and I thought first we might start with the location, because I think for some of us, geography matters and we need to know kind of where things are happening so we can wrap our head around it and envision it in our head as we dig in on sort of the storytelling behind the document. Um, this is an image of Independence Hall. Uh, Independence Hall is the location where uh, the, the Declaration of Independence was officially adopted um, and uh, later on where the Constitution um, is officially adopted. So we'll talk more about that later on in the week as we are nearing towards Constitution Day. Um, but this is a, a picture that I took this summer when I was in Philadelphia, uh, which was a, a fun trip and I got a great insider view on some of these things. This image that you're seeing right here is actually the Declaration House. Um, this is where Jefferson stayed um, and actually wrote the Declaration of Independence. So you can see the space. Uh, it's a few blocks away from Independence Hall, but there is something sort of cool about acknowledging and walking right next to this building where this document was written in 1776 um, and to realize that you know most of the outside um, is of course original. So it's one of the cool things about being back east, right, as you get to see these buildings from that time. And then lastly, this is actually uh, the room. Um, now, I would say the room where it happens, but that's from Hamilton, and that actually has a completely different uh, reference. So uh, this is the room. This is the room where the Declaration of Independence was signed, um, and then later on where the Constitution was argued um, and signed as well. So we'll talk a bit more about that at the end of the week, but this is sort of the setting um, of, of where this work comes from. I'm gonna flip um, a bit and take a look at another document. This is actually from the National Archives and I'm gonna go ahead and link this onto our Google Classroom so you can play around with it. Um, it does give you the background history of the document itself and the Committee of Five. Um, but one of the other things it does is it talks about the ink and the parchment that's used and how the documents traveled. And so you might find that really interesting as sort of some fun facts around the Declaration, um, which I think is really just helpful in understanding some of that early history. But what our intention to do today is just to talk about the segments of the Declaration. Now I have a video um, that I'll also be co-posting on here with um, Jeffrey Rosen. Jeffrey Rosen is the CEO of the National Constitution Center, and he has done a series called Constitution 101. It's a great series, and we'll be watching some videos from it. But um, So there'll be a brief video that goes through uh, details on, uh, on the preamble itself. But what I want to do with the document is just show you kind of how it's segmented, and you can totally follow along with me if you want to do it with a highlighter. Um, grab your document. You can do this with a pen. It doesn't really matter. But uh, if I were in class with you, we would do this together anyway. So when you're looking at the Declaration of Independence, since so here's the Declaration in front of you, I think this is the same copy you have. When you're looking at the Declaration of Independence, I think we oftentimes can see that it does have some segments associated with it. There's some obvious ones on the document, but I do want to highlight some of them. So this very first segment um, is what we call the preamble. And I'm gonna highlight that here, um, just as its own color. So this is the preamble. Um, a preamble is sort of an introduction. It sets the stage. Um, and so you can see it there. And then we move into the next segment of the document, which by now most of you have acknowledged is the section on um, natural rights. So we see this as the Declaration of Natural Rights. See, I'm doing green for go. So now we have two sections identified in the document. We have the preamble and the Declaration of Natural Rights. Then we move into this whole section called he has, right? Or you see the he hases. Um, I always think it's really interesting to point out, of course, is that largely um, the he is, um, it's done for rhetorical reasons. Uh, because, of course, it's generally Parliament that's been engaging in these actions. But nonetheless, uh, the 
Um, the committee has decided to blame the king, and that's, of course, quite intentional and for reasons we've kind of talked about. But this whole section is called the list of grievances, the list of grievances. And there are a lot of grievances they have. So I am going to stop the grievances there. Um, so I'm going to put our grievances as orange. Okay. That's all of those. And they're pretty detailed as you've taken a look, right? Um, he's refused his assent to laws, right? Meaning like they have laws that they want to pass and they're not able to, um, they're not allowing governors to pass laws. Um, and the King, according to the document is suspending those laws. Um, there's some that are really interesting, I think, to highlight that he's dissolved representative houses repeatedly. The House of Burgesses, which was the, the state house um, in colonial government uh, in Virginia, was dissolved routinely by the king um, and by parliament at different times. Um, he's endeavored to prevent the population of these states, right, trying to prevent immigration from occurring. I um, mean, obstructed the administration of justice. We've talked a little bit about how um, it was really challenging for people to have trials in the colonies. They had to, to go overseas to do that. He's kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of the legislatures, right? Um, and of which those of standing armies, of course, had to stay in the colonies under the Quartering Act, which we see again, right, for quartering large bodies of armed troops amongst us. We're just gonna highlight that this section right here Quartering Act, the identification of quartering in the Declaration of Independence um, later on leads to the Third Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So clearly it really bothers them. And then there's a whole slew of them, right? Cutting off trade, imposing taxes, um, depriving us of trial by jury. Again, you're going to see a lot of these kind of come back again, uh, come back up with the U.S. Constitution, taking away charters, plundering our seas, there's just a variety of them. So all of these things that I've identified in orange for you are the list of grievances. And then we move into the fourth part of the document. The fourth part of the document is the resolution um, for independence. And in the resolution for independence, which is this, that's where um, the committee has decided that they've got the send off, right? Like. Um, you can look at the language carefully, and I hope that you have, but um, they've been attempting to work with the British government. It's not working. They're attempting, they're trying and trying and trying, and finally, um, they are representatives of the United States and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions and the good people of the colonies. Um, and so they declare independence, and we see that here in the final stage, and I'm going to have that be... Purple. Okay, so I've segmented for you this document so that you can see the four parts, the preamble, the Declaration of Natural Rights, the list of grievances, and the resolutions for independence. So hopefully that gives you a little bit background to the structure of the document. Um, again, I really want you to take a look at this Jeffrey Rosen video um, from Constitution 101, which gives you the principles of the American Revolution and helps you far more understand the natural rights section of the Declaration, which is foundational to who we are as a people and our forms of government later on. Um, and then lastly, I have that sort of fun facts, interesting things about the Declaration from the National Archives, which I would just encourage you to take a look at and maybe skim if you're interested. Um, the last thing I want to close with today is just a general acknowledgement that the Declaration of Independence is not law. And I think that this is really important for under, us to understand. I find way too often people try to make an argument that life, liberty, and, hap and the pursuit of happiness is law. And that is not what this document is. The Articles of Confederation, that creates a framework of government for laws. Um, we see laws or frameworks of government embedded within the U.S. Constitution, but the Declaration is not those. The Declaration instead is really more um, a statement of purpose, right? Why is independence um, happening and what is it that the colonists are so upset about? So it's not law at all, but rather a statement of purpose or rather you could even suggest like a statement of philosophy. Um, but what it does do is it does officially declare independence. 
But I also come back to acknowledge that that doesn't mean it happens, right? That's, this is where the touch point is for the war. It is through war that independence is gained. It is not through the document itself. So make sure that we're really clear that when we talk about documents that form governments, we're talking about the Articles of Confederation, later on the U.S. Constitution, abetted with the um, Bill of Rights. But this document kind of talks more to us about purpose. It's sort of like a vision statement, if that will help you. And so with that, um, I say enjoy the rest of the videos and your additional learning on this document. Um, I'm looking forward to talking with you more tomorrow about the Articles of Confederation.